Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on MovieHouseMemories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. You're listening to Lunchtime Movie Review from LunchtimeMovieReview.com. And we are the children of the 80s. Children of the 80s are back with the rom-com from our childhood. I'm Chris. <laughs> I'm Patrick. And for this episode, we are reviewing 1987's Love Fest, Full Metal Jacket, directed by Stanley Kubrick and starring Matthew Modine, Adam Baldwin, no relation, Vincent, how do we say Vincent's last name? D'Onofrio. D'Onofrio. Harley Armory, Dorian Har- uh, Harwood, and Arliss Howard, to name a few. No Vin Diesel in this film, in this war film, which I'm sure you're ecstatic about. Well, any film without Vin Diesel is already better than any film with Vin Diesel. It's just the way it works. That, that's true. And he's tiny, so anything in he, that he's in is a fantasy film, I think, according to our rule. Isn't it? Well, I don't think he's that tiny. Oh, okay. Uh, but before we begin... We have a word from our half-assed sponsor, because Chris did not have a whole lot of time to write this one. Today's podcast is brought to you by Hanoi Jane's Jelly Donuts. Friends, are you hungry at all hours of the night? Does your empty tummy feel like a soap-filled sock that's pounding you all over the place? Are you yearning for a perfect snack that will make your pals hit the floor and give you 20 Well, we have something that will make your head explode. Sweet, delicious, and always filling Hanoi Jane's Jelly Donuts. They love you long time. (laughs) I was wondering. I I figured that was going to be in some sort of version of your commercial. but Well, you know, also, anytime we've got Vietnam and war, Hanoi Jane is going to be there. And I do have an eloquently detailed summary. Patrick, pull up a chair. Full Metal Jacket begins with new Marine recruits getting their heads shaved at the start of their basic training on, is it Paris Island, Patrick? Paris Island. They they have an extra R, so I didn't know if it was pronounced differently. At least that's the way it's pronounced in the Billy Joel song, so I just assumed. Well, Billy's never wrong. You're correct. Drill instructor, gunnery sergeant Hartman. Greets the man and tells them that they will all hate him soon enough, but he's going to treat them all equally, no matter their background. But I'm not going to get into the types of backgrounds he went into. Not politically correct. Hartman then goes to each man to test their mental fortitude, giving them nicknames as he passes to strip away those old identities and mold them into lean, mean killers. He names J.T. Davis Joker after he smarts off to him. Private Evans is from Texas, and we all know about them Texans, so he starts calling him Cowboy. And the dim-witted recruit, Leonard Lawrence, he calls Gomer Pyle. Pyle, of course, immediately gets under Hartman's skin because he cannot follow instructions. He's overweight, and he can't keep up physically with the other recruits. One night during hand and foot inspection, or do you know what the hell that's called, Patrick? I was never in the military. No, either was I. So I don't know other than I think they're checking for athlete's foot and to make sure that they just want everybody to not be at any risk for any kind of uh, malady or something like that. Well, during this inspection, Hartman finds Pyle's foot locker is unlocked and he flips his wig. He inspects the locker to see what's missing and finds a Hanoi Jane jelly donut contraband. Uh Uh-oh. Not only is the food banned in the barracks, but Hartman's forbidden pile to eat junk food as he's a little overweight to begin with. Actor gained 70 pounds for this role, so you know he's more than a little overweight. Instead of punishing Pyle, he punishes the entire squad while ordering Pyle to eat that delicious donut. 
from here on, Hartman has decided he's going to punish all the other recruits anytime Pyle messes up. And we'll get at least one more from him in the next five minutes. Uh, so obviously this is going to make the other recruits hate Pyle. And a few nights later, they had they attack him with soap bars wrapped in towels while Cowboy gags him and a few other fellas hold him down on the bunk by his blankie. Cowboy peer pressures Joker into hitting him with the soap as well. And while he's reluctant at first, Joker just goes off on him because he's been taking the most shit for Pyle's screw-ups the whole film. Uh, after the beating, as Pyle cries out in pain, Joker covers his ears. Uh, and I guess partially because he's ashamed that he participated, that he caved. I guess. Uh, this event, of course, causes Pyle to completely break mentally. He was on the edge all this time, anyhow. Uh, on the outside, it appears he becomes an exceptional marksman, but Joker overhears Pyle talking to his rifle and not in a good way. He tells Cowboy that Pyle is a Section 8, which I guess is mentally unfit to serve. Is that about what we decide, Patrick? Yes. The only other Section 8 in the film is a guy who can't stop masturbating in front of anything that moves and anything that doesn't move. So take it from there. Throughout thick and thin, all the recruits, even Pyle graduate. Yay, Pyle. Hartman gives them their new assignments, mostly in the Vietnam. I think there are mostly infantry, if I remember right. Correct. On their final night, Joker is the night watch, and uh, he finds Pyle alone in the head, and everything comes to a head there. I see what Stanley did there. Uh, he catches Pyle loading his rifle while reciting the Rifleman's Creed over and over. As Joker stands there in, in uh, fear and uncertainty, Hartman shows up from the ruckus. Joker tells him that Pyle has a full metal jacket in his rifle and Hartman tries to disarm the situation. Pyle shoots and kills Hartman before killing himself in the head, in the head, when everything came to a head. Stanley's fucking brilliant. A year passes, I guess, uh, I assume, and Joker is in, oh, some Vietnamese words. If I can't, I can't even pronounce English words, so I'm going to butcher these Vietnamese words. Da Nang? Is that where he was? Da Nang. Da Nang. I guess I just have to say it with more confidence. Where he's reporting yeah. on the Vietnam War for the military newspaper Stars and Stripes. He and his combat photographer, Rafter Man, meet a prostitute working the streets when a thief steals Rafterman's camera. As the boys walk back to their base, cameraless and uh, poonannyless, I guess. And I think things fell through. Rafterman laments that he, that the uh, U.S. is there to help the South Vietnamese, but they respond by taking advantage of the soldiers. It's completely what's going on there. Uh, back at the base, their commanding officer, Lieutenant Lockhorn, no, Lockhart, sorry, uh, reviews all the reporter's latest stories with his staff. Uh, Joker wants to go to the front lines for a good story and thinks the Viet Cong are going to break the holiday ceasefire. I think they're going to as well. Uh, Lockhart balks, though, at the news and thinks that the Vietnamese will have their holiday with no issues. That's one that aged well for him. That evening, Rafterman tells the other reporters that he wants to go into combat like Joker. But another reporter makes fun of him because he knows the Joker has never been in combat because he doesn't have that thousand-yard stare. Suddenly, artillery fire hits their base as the North Vietnamese Army attempts to overrun it as part of the beginning of the Tet Offensive. Boy, Lieutenant Lockhart's looking pretty bad already. Uh, what happens? Uh, Joker and the other GIs successfully defend, defend the base, but it wasn't hit as hard as the other locations in the country, which effectively split it in two. The next day, as the sun rises, Lockhart tells his staff about enemy attacks throughout South Vietnam. Uh, when the Joker smarts off, because that's his name, uh, Lockhart sends him to an operating base near the city of Hue. Who? H-U-E, Patrick? Hue? Uh, that one I do not know. Uh, if anybody speaks Vietnamese, please correct me. I'm going to say Hue, though. Where he will cover the combat taking place there. Rafterman, still looking for combat experience, requests to join the Joker. 
and Lockhart approves that request. During the helicopter ride over, two men are the two men are horrified to watch the uh, crazed door gunner indiscriminately shoot at the unarmed Vietnamese citizens on the ground. Once they land outside, uh, Hugh, Joker, and Raptor Man track down Cowboy and his squad. Joker accompanies them to a battle in the city, and as they approach the ruins under tank cover, several mortar rounds land in front of them. One kills the squad's commanding officer, Lieutenant Touchdown, and with him gone, Crazy Earl takes command, and the group is able to stave off the enemy. It's pretty amazing nicknames. Patrick, we need some some podcasting nicknames like this. Days later, in even more ruins, Crazy Earl comes across a toy rabbit in one building, and I think he picked it up. Did he pick it up, Patrick? Or he just went near it? Yeah. So when he picked it up, it trigger, triggers a booby trap, and that trap kills him. That damn data. Booby trap. Uh, the command promotes Cowboy, who is not ready to be the squad leader, but he is anyway. And on his first task out, they become lost in the ruins. When 8-Ball, is that drug-related because he's black, Patrick? Yeah. that That's not right. Uh, when he scouts the buildings ahead, an unseen sniper shoots him. Doc J then tries to drag 8-Ball to safety, but the sniper, hit, sniper hits him too. The sniper doesn't kill the wounded men. Instead, uh, he's attempting to draw more of the squad into shooting range. Very smart. With no tank support available, their M60 machine gunner, Animal Mother, not related, ignores Cowboy's order to withdraw. He heads to the buildings to locate the sniper, and when he does, the remaining squad goes to help. When the sniper shoots and kills Cowboy through a hole in one of the buildings, Animal Mother assumes command. He says, let's go get some payback, but it's not as good as when Arnold says a line like that. The squad enters the building under the cover of smoke grenades, uh, and the Joker is eventually eventually finds the sniper on an upper floor, but his, uh, his rifle jams when he tries to kill him. The sniper turns around to reveal that he is actually a teenage girl. At least I assume it's a teenage girl, very young girl. She opens fire with her automatic rifle, pinning him behind a column, in a panic, the Joker drops his rifle and pulls out his sidearm, but he's unable to shoot back. Raptor Man arrives and shoots the sniper, rendering her helpless, but doesn't kill her. Animal Mother and the remaining squad arrive. They surround the girl. It's clear she's not going to survive, but she's not able to die just yet. She tells the men to shoot her, but Animal Mother wants to just leave the girl to the rats. Joker says they have to do something, damn it, Jim. And so Animal Mother says, well, go ahead, shoot her if you want. If that's your if that's your fucking attitude, Joker. See how funny this one is. Uh, with much hesitation, Joker shoots her with a sidearm. The men uh, sarcastically congratulate him on his first kill. And the Joker gives that thousand yard stare that all fighting men get. In the final scene, the squad marches through the ruined buildings as their burning hulks light up the night sky, the men sing the Mickey Mouse March. Patrick, you know the song. Sing along. Uh, the Joker says that even though he's in a world of shit, he's glad to be alive and is no longer afraid. Cue Tinkerbell to put the little wand over the castle for a happy ending. The end. Patrick, how did this rom-com do in the theaters? <laughs> All right, Full Metal Jacket, which is actually based on a 1979 novel called The Short Timers by Gustav Hasford. By any chance, did you read the book? I did not. Okay. I didn't know it was based on a book until I researched it for this podcast. So I might go out and look look up the book to see kind of the differences. I hope Gustav liked the uh, the film more than Stephen King liked The Shining. <laughs> uh, it was released on June 26, 1987, the same day as Spaceballs, Dragnet, and Jean de Florette, uh, the same month as Roxanne, The Witches of Eastwick, M Million Dollar Mystery, The Believers, The Untouchables, Harry and the Hendersons, and Chris's all-time favorite film, Benji the Hunted. There's some great films, and Benji the, Hun the Hunted just tops them all off. Uh, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, made on a budget of $30 million, the film grossed over $46 million in the United States, it was the 23rd highest grossing film of 1987 behind such classics as Eddie Murphy Raw, 
planes, trains, and automobiles, and the re-release of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and right in front of A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors, The Last Emperor, and Wall Street. Was nominated for one Academy Award, winning none. Uh, best writing screenplay based on material from another medium. Lost to the film The Last Emperor. Uh, was on Gene Siskel's list of best films of 1987. Is included in the 1001 Movies You Must See Before You Die book. And AFI placed it at number 95 on its 2001 100 Years, 100 Thrills list. Rotten Tomatoes has it at 91% critics and 94% audience. And that is the numbers on Full Metal Jacket. Now, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that this is our seventh Stanley Kubrick film, and he only made 13. Uh, I don't know if you would consider Spartacus a review that we did because it, I think it was just for Criterion Critics. Oh, but uh, is this our most reviewed director for their body of... Oh, I would say, I would say probably be Spielberg because you get Jaws, Close Encounters, four Indiana Jones films, mm. um, no. E.T. That's seven right there. <laughs> yeah, no, I, you're you're correct. So he's got it. He is up there though. No, he's easily easily up there. So let's let's start with him, Stanley Kubrick. You you know you're always going to get a great film from him. I think I've seen almost all of them except for Eyes Wide Shut. You've never seen Eyes Wide Shut? I don't think so. Uh, I kind of got uh, turned off on the uh, Tom Cruise. Uh, what the hell is his wife's name? Nicole Shane's, Kidman. Nicole Kidman. Shane's going to kill me. Uh, I, I wasn't really interested at that time, and I just never got around to it. But in, in terms of Stanley Kubrick films, uh, what what was your sense of this one? You already kind of mentioned that you thought it was two kind of different films. So. Right, that right there, which I do agree with you, uh, kind of put sets this one apart from his other films. Yeah, you know, like as Stanley Kubrick, I think, is a very skilled director, and this is one of my favorite films of his. Now, that being said, it, it to me, there's there's basic training and then there's Vietnam, and there's two distinctly different films. Uh, and it was interesting during my research to see that there was that criticism was made of this film back then. Billy Wilder, you know, famous director Billy Wilder, said if the film had ended at the end of basic training after uh, Private Pyle had killed the drill sergeant, it would have been one of the, the possibly one of the best films he'd ever seen. Um, unfortunately, it went on for another hour and 15 minutes beyond that. And he, he just, it, to me, this film is so fascinating watching the basic training portion of it and then the, the the Vietnam aspect of it is pretty pedestrian. I've seen it in a lot of other films, and I would honestly say I think I've seen it better, you know, in Platoon, that whole Vietnam sequence. I, I know that it's supposed to show this progression of Joker to this killer, this, what they were trying to train him to be, but he never fully adapted. And by the end of the film, you, fi you finally get there. But it seems that the transition is pretty abrupt and, uh, you know, in the last five, 10 minutes of the film and pretty much five minutes of the film and even his transition into that kind of killer is somewhat of a mercy killing. You know, he's, he's putting her out of her misery. He's not killing her out of spite or revenge. He's doing what many could consider the honorable thing, uh, to the snipe, the Vietnam, Vietnamese sniper. So, um, but yeah, I think it's very distinctly two different films. I happen to like the first half of the film much better. I think it's a very, very fascinating film watching what goes on in basic training and how these men react to it and kind of this crumbling of the psyche of Pyle. Uh, I, th I think that's a very, I think the best performance is coming from there. Arlie Emery, how he was not nominated for a best supporting actor for this role I, I think is he was robbed. He was nominated for a Golden Globe, but he was not nominated for an Oscar. And I think he should have been because I thought it was an unbelievably uh, real, obviously, performance since he was a drill instructor. Well, I think other than the references to Two Live Crews, Me So Horny, he is probably the number one thing that people remember the most about this film. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's such a visceral performance that, I you know, I remember watching this probably in 88. I didn't catch this in the theater, but it was something that came on HBO 
and I watched it with my dad. And my dad went into basic training for Air Force, and so it wasn't the Marines. But he said, you know, that's, you know, that's my memory kind of basic training. You know, he's the, 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 the physical violence, the abuse, you know, the punching and slapping. He's like, that didn't happen. But, you know, that how uh, everything else, breaking uh, the men's spirits and then kind of rebuilding them into a fighting machine. He's like, that's that was basic training. Yeah, and to go back to Stanley Kubrick, I think uh, it was uh, Roger Ebert said something like it, it felt more like a series of short stories than a, a, yeah. a complete film. And I think if, uh, to me, I think that's the best description that I've seen of this film, that it does seem like, uh, for me, uh, it's, it seems like about three separate stories. And, uh, and so I don't mind it, but it, it either needed to be, like you said, Stanley needed to just go full blast with the, the basic training or maybe cut back on that and have it three solid stories or, or something like that to show more of a progression, beginning, middle, end or something. No, no I, I agree with you. I mean, because yeah, obviously basic training is one element of it. Joker pre being sent into the war is a second element. His life in Vietnamese kind of cushy life working as in the press corps. Uh, and then the, you know, the last element of him actually being sent in and actually having to experience combat and lose one of his friends during the process. Because that that's pretty much what he had to do. He had to lose that. That was his purpose of this film was to lose people to the point that, uh, Mr. Uh, peace sign over his heart lost out to the, uh, born to kill that was in his head in the helmet that he was wearing. Once yeah. Again, once again, Stanley with the symbolism, right? Let's talk about some actors, Matthew Modine. Uh, is this his best film he's done that you've seen him in? <laughs> You know, I think of Matthew Modine as more lighthearted. Uh, yes. That it's a pretty serious drama, like Married to the Mob. I'm trying to think of something else lighthearted. But uh, uh, right now, I'm thinking of all his dramatic work, The Dark Knight and Wind and, God, what else did he do? Uh, Vision Quest. Um, but I, I tend to think of him as a light co kind of comedy actor. Uh, Married to the Mob is the one that pops out most prominently. You know, he was okay. I don't think he's a great actor. Uh, I, you know, I thought D'Onofrio was really good. I thought Arlie Emery was pretty good. I thought Adam Baldwin was pretty good. But, you know, everybody else was uh, this kind of fake tough tone that they all take. It, it, it becomes pretty one note. You know, I don't think the acting was the best performance or the, the best aspect of it other than the acting of the three actors that I thought were really kind of standoutish. But they were supposed to stand out. They were supposed to draw the attention of the audience. I mean, it, you can't put Arlie Emery in there and not think that everybody is going to just fixate on what this man is saying at any point in time because it is just a fascinating and enthralling performance that it just draws the viewer's attention constantly whenever he's on screen. And he did not have any that many official acting roles before this. Am I correct? I, I think he mainly worked as consultants on other films. I know he had done Platoon, but I think he was, uh, I think he had a small part in Platoon because he worked as a consultant with Oliver Stone. And that's kind of how he got into acting is working as a, a consultant for uh, war movies. I think he was actually involved. I don't know if he was in or if he was involved in Siege of Firebase Gloria that we watched a couple of years ago with Shane. That was a really big piece of crap, but I think that uh, was the year after it was like 88 or maybe even 89, maybe not. But yeah, you know, I, that was kind of his bread and butter during that time frame, and, and, and then he goes beyond this later to be a full blown actor and doing much grander. Well, I don't want to say grander, but much more distinctly different roles that he's not just playing the military man. You have him in Fletch lives playing uh, the uh, evangelist. You have him in dead man walking, uh, playing the father of a murdered girl. Uh, I mean, he's, he's, you know, he, he takes on much more, much more difficult roles uh, after this. And possibly the most important role was Sarge in Toy Story. Let's not forget. I, I, how, how can I forget that? But I would say that it falls into military man. That's kind of the same thing. I think he had some voice work in super, uh, uh, not super troopers. What the hell? Starship Troopers, if I remember correctly. Other actors, 
Adam Baldwin at this time, non Baldwin brother. I, if I haven't said that already, uh, that he, I would knew him mostly from the 1980, my bodyguard, which was on the damn HBO loop, like 50 million times. I must've seen that literally 30, 40 times. Yeah, him. It was a Chris Makepeace, I think, that was in it with yeah, him. Yeah, Mr. But, Sensitive of the late seventies, early eighties. Yeah, that, that I I remember watching that many many times, and I I distinctly remember him, and but I I think he's a, a you know an underappreciated actor. I really like him in a lot of films. He gives, there's a sense of comfort, you know. I I in in television, I know he played a heavy in one season of the X files and pretty much the only, that was after Duchovny left. And pretty much the only reason I was watching it is because he was in it. Uh, and then uh, obviously one of my all time favorite television shows is firefly, which he has a, a great supporting role in, but yeah, he's a great actor. He's underappreciated. And in this one, did he blink? Because he did have the thousand yard stare that they made a big, uh, fuss about. And, uh, Watching it this time, I'm like, I don't think this guy is blinking. I, I don't think he blinked at any point in time. Mm, great performance. Size must have got tired. Cinematography. Uh, I always like Stanley Kubrick's cinematography. He is very particular about his takes. Could do many, many takes. Although Arlie Armory did his most of his in just a couple. And... um but what I did like, and I think this was, I read somewhere that they did not want a blue sky when they were in Vietnam. And if the sun was out, they didn't shoot. But uh, I thought that, uh, I mean, you said that it was done better in Platoon, but I still liked the cinematography, especially the ending scene where they're singing the Mickey Mouse song amongst the flames and the debris and, uh, you know, the most American thing you can think of, Mickey Mouse and all this destruction. But uh, what did you think of the cinematography? I, no, I, I thought the cinematography is great. And I want to clarify my comment that, you know, that it was like some, something I've seen before. As far as the action sequences and Vietnam fighting sequences, it wasn't anything groundbreaking to me. There was not, nothing surprising to me about this that I thought Platoon did, did it better. But the cinematography was really, really great. But it also, once again, supports my you know, argument of two distinctly different films, the Vietnam portion of it and the basic training portion of it, because there's the way those visuals are even captured on film are distinctly different and are shot completely different from each other. And there's no overall, I guess, theme, uh, for cinematography in it and it, which is fine uh, you, they're trying he, he's trying to do it visually and i i agree with you that you know the one one thing about kubrick is the way he shoots his films is always very very interesting and fascinating do you think that they drew the line well enough for the joker character to make it this idea of one film you know that this evolution of this character um, or, or do you think that it is just as, as the criticisms are two distinctly different films or a, a series of vignettes ca- following this Joker character where we just capture him at different moments in his life is d- d- does he have a beginning, middle and end? The, the way I kind of look at it is he's a reporter for the stars and stripes. So if you look at it as he's writing three different articles for the paper. So, you know, you got basic training, you got the cushy, uh, you're trying to make up stuff, but you're really not seeing the action that he's in the comfort zone. Then he gets this story based on the thousand yard stare. So I see the the transition that they want and how it might fit in with his, this notion that it's like three newspaper articles. Did Stanley accurately convey that? Is that what he was going for? I don't know. I would say it wasn't accurately conveyed. I'm just reading it into it because you know how I can get with films. Uh, but uh, I don't have a problem with it looking like three separate films. But I think the fact that the, the first section, Paris Island was what, 45 minutes, 50 minutes long? 45 minutes. I think that's, I think the, the spacing of each of the stories is what kind of it is unsettling about his transition, if that makes sense. Not not the actual story itself, maybe is that? No, I, I get what you're saying. It's the too too much jump in time that 
you you don't see where this character is. you see where the character is and then suddenly it's some time later <laughs> and he's in Vietnam long hair hiring prostitutes or negotiating with prostitutes uh, but still not fighting in the war yeah, and I think that was also something that Stanley was meaning to say there, there there's a lot of references to sex and kind of men using women in this film. Uh, well, I mean, yes, but I think it was also an accurate representation of American soldiers in Vietnam during that time frame. You know, like the, they weren't over there to fall in love. They were over there to fight. And while they weren't fighting, if they had a down moment and there was a Vietnamese prostitute, they were going to take advantage of it much as they could. I, I, I was not offended by the betrayal of women in this other than there's basically you have the sniper and you have the prostitute or prostitutes. I think there are two. I think um, so, yeah. That's, yeah, that's it. That's all you have as far as any kind of representation of a woman in the film. Other than the, the few that were getting shot in the fields by the psycho gunner. Correct. Which was I mean, very, that, that might've been one of the most disturbing scenes of the film. Yeah, I mean, no, it, it it is actually one of the most disturbing scenes in the film, but the idea of it, yet everybody still accepts it, you know, that it, it wasn't like he was, it was, no one didn't know what he was doing. He got confirmed kills um, and, and recognition for that. And, you know, the, the, I, you know, there there was an inconsistency of some uh, the characters, like the photographer who so desperately wanted to get in the shit, and then he sees this helicopter sniper killing just innocent, you know, people while they fly by, and he's so turned off by that. But by the end of the film, he is just rah rah go team, you know. He kind of had a romanticized notion of war. Maybe that was something Stanley wanted to talk about in his film as well. Maybe, but it, 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 as I said, the, the, there was an aspect that I didn't think the characters were clearly written well enough to really understand who they are. Even Pyle, who has a very distinctive end, a beginning, middle, and end, but it comes in a 45-minute period, is you don't know much about him You know, coming into it. He seems a little slow and dim-witted. But is he slow and dim-witted, or is he just overwhelmed by what he's going through in basic training? And you never really kind of figure that out. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't think very many of these guys, they even bothered giving first names. And as far as the recruits, I think only uh, Joker, do we know anything about him? That he was a reporter in high school, and Cowboy was from Texas. But other than that, we knew nothing about any of these men. We knew Cowboy had a sister. Oh. Uh, because he wanted to sl uh, Joker wanted to sli slide his beefsteak into her, uh, but that was about all we knew about Cowboy. Yeah, he was from Texas, but. And if you look at Arlie Armory's uh, pins, I read that it looked like he had a Purple Heart from Vietnam. Right. I mean, but you'd have to know something about the military background to be able to recognize that. No clue myself. Yes, I had to yeah. read it. Correct. I, I, I read that as well. Um, but, you know, uh, he was just an antagonist. That's all he was. He was to move them forward and prepare them for war. Uh, and I, I think he did his job effectively, but even still in an abbreviated portion. This could have been just about the basic training, and I think it would have been a great film. And if you if you liked it well enough, then you can make a second film about Joker's, you know, uh, you know, adventures in Vietnam, if you wanted to. Well, you see, they really couldn't do it because already in production was Biloxi Blues with Christopher Walken. And that is the premier boot camp military film of the 80s. I would disagree with you. <laughs> there was a lot of boot camp-esque movies in the 80s, now that I think of it. Stripes, Biloxi Blues. This one, uh, what else? Officer Pri and Gentleman. Officer Gentleman, Private Benjamin. Uh, what the hell else? There's just a slew. I, I don't know if that was something that was big in the 80s. It was a kind of a, a motif, if you will, for a while. But no 80s montage. Well, maybe Private Benjamin had an 80s montage. It's been a while since I've seen that one. 
can't go wrong with Goldie and camouflage. All right. Well, let's keep this one brief. Does this film stand the test of time? And of the Stanley Kubrick films that you've been on, you've reviewed, where does this one rank? Upper half, bottom half. I think you already might have said, actually. Uh, Patrick? Uh, yeah, I do think it stands the test of time. It, it's a kind of a time capsule for uh, covering the early 60s and the beginning of the Vietnam War, or at least the, the heavy U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. Um, I think the basic training portion of it is really intense uh, and therefore is the best portion of it, even though the, I think the Vietnam portion is also intense. I just don't I, – I find the first half – more interesting to watch than the second half. Uh, as far as Stanley Kubrick films, I said it was one of my favorites. It's still, I, I do consider it one of my favorites. It is a flawed film, and I can see why many people, especially a lot of cinephiles, don't consider this the best of Kubrick's films. Spartacus is, is probably a better overall film, and I have learned to appreciate The Shining as I've gotten older. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I did not care for a clockwork orange um too eyes grotesque watch. for you yeah it's just too disturbing it, it's much much like um taxi driver mm -hmm. i just don't like watching that i i appreciate it for the artistic uh, attempts that they made and risks that they took in the film but i can't i don't like the film overall and it doesn't make me feel good watching it <laughs> no. even for entertainment's sake so I've seen it once, uh, and I have no interest in ever watching it again. Uh, Eyes Wide Shut is strange for strange sake, and, and then kind of wraps up really rapidly at the end. So I'm a little bit disappointed in the ending of that. And then some of his earlier work, and I'm blanking in some of it, is it's solid. But I would put this up there as one of the best two or three of Kubrick's career. Were you on the review that we did of The Killing? I was not. That's a pretty good film. As for me, I guess I should say, uh, this one, of course, stands the test of time. You couldn't tell that it was made today versus 1987. So I, I think it's great. And at this point, I'm even tired of a lot of war films, especially Vietnam films. We've reviewed so many on this podcast. But at just under two hours, this film did go pretty quick, even though, you know, the, the second half wasn't as enthralling as the first half. Uh, it I don't think that at any point did I realize that I was looking at my watch or, you know, waiting for this thing to get over. I don't think that this is one of my favorite Kubrick films. It's very hard for me to rank them because so many of them that I, I do like clockwork orange is definitely a tough watch, but you don't like uh 2001 space odyssey either. You, that, no. that one bores you, right? That one bores the crap out of yeah, me. I thought that you've said that in the past, but I do enjoy that one. Love Dr. Strange love. Uh, love, Dr. Strange Love is a great one, yes. I uh, love The Killing. Uh, I think you and I both like Paths of Glory. Yes, I, don't I know, love, love Paths of Glory. I don't know if you put that one in your top 100, but he, he just does a great job uh, throughout his whole career, so uh, I have nothing really bad to say about him. Well, that's it for our review of Full Metal Jacket. Please let us know what you think of the film in the comment section. And for our listeners over on moviehousememories.com, please rate it from one to five stars on that page as well. If you enjoyed today's review, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, the MHM Podcast Network, where we have many, many more film reviews from yesterday, today, and beyond. Until next time, I'm Chris. And I'm Private Popcorn. And we have to get out of here, and you guys are invited. This podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The theme song for Lunchtime Movie Review, Fireworks, is brought to you by Alexander Nakarada at SerpentSoundStudios.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Lunchtime Movie Review, the MHM Podcast Network, 
and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted.